that God will go and touch the lives of people ahead of uh, as these events are happening. The Nazarene Youth Conference, which is in Tampa, Florida, and our local camps and uh, the Vacation Bible School and 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 all that. So lift up all these uh, things uh, which are happening to the Lord. Uh, this, uh, you know, in your personal prayer, also pray for the folks who are uh, who need touch from God, health-wise, and um, we will be praying for them. But I want to, as we bow before Him today, this morning, um, let's read this this verse. This is what it is. It says. This is um, the life that is God expects of us. And it says this, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And it's a very important thing. It says, the there is no law against these things. Let's reflect on that. Let's call out to God that God will help us to, this, these fruits will be produced in our life. Father in heaven, we come before you, O oh God, this morning. Thank you, God, for your presence here, your spirit, O oh God. As we sing unto you, O oh Father, sometimes in a silence and Sometimes we pour out our voices unto you and we worship you through our heart and our soul, O oh God, through the diff different expression of worship, O oh Father God. The reason we worship you, O oh God, is just because not for the sake of entertaining our mind or our soul, but we want to worship you and that is our attitude and if and oh god if that is not our attitude lead us towards that attitude the reason we worship oh god because we acknowledge you as our god and we have a relationship with you and you seek us oh god doesn't matter on the face of this earth that you long to have a worship worshipful relationship with us oh God and in response to that we worship you we take this time to sing songs to you oh father from our heart to offer worship to you oh father God because of what you have done in our life and the relationship that we have with you oh father God Search our heart, search our mind, and take us to that place where we truly worship you through our hearts and our minds to offer you worship, O oh Father. And we surrender ourselves before you this morning. O oh God, we pray today, we pause and we pray for each one of us here who are in the sanctuary today, and anyone who is watching online or will be watching online, you know the what is going on within our heart. You know what is going on in our mind. You know the unrestful things that are causing probably troubles in our, in our soul, in our heart. And Father, we want to just pray for each and every individual who are disturbed, who are worried, who are who don't know what is going on. There is undue pressure on their lives, oh God, because of variety of situations in their life, whatever it may be. That they're finding it difficult, oh Father, to navigate life. We want to ask for your peace, oh Father, that comes from you. Reach out to each soul, O oh God, today. Touch them in a very special way. Have mercy upon them, O oh God, and your promise is true yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. 
that you will take us through these situations. And your peace is real in these situations. That we should seek more and more of you if anybody is going through these uncomfortable situations, oh God. And we want to lift them up to you. As a body of Christ, we want to pray for everyone today and we want to join voices, oh God, to you for each and every one who is going through difficult times, oh God. Reach out to their soul and give them the peace and have mercy upon them and your presence is with them and with us today. Thank you, God. Father, we pray for each and every individual who are going through uh, difficult times health-wise, oh God. We, we are thankful for folks who are who are uh, healing and had procedures and surgeries, oh God. And Father, we, we are so grateful and thankful for that, but they still need your healing touch, oh Father. So watch over them, give them the strength, oh God, that they need. And heal them, oh God, from the health challenges that they're going through. People who are still seeking the health, oh Father God, just reach out to them, oh Father, and, 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 and touch them and, and bring healing to their bodies, oh Father. This is our prayer today for each person, oh God. God, we want to open our heart and our mind and keep worshiping you through our uh, reflecting upon the word of God and also through the giving of our tithes and offering, O oh Father, as we always pray. If this is an act of worship to you. And, O oh God, check our attitude and check our, our heart of giving, O oh Father. Uh, fill, help us to give you with joyful heart, with a happy heart. And, O oh God, that you will accept our, our, our worship through the giving, O oh Father. And as your word says... Test me that if you will not, if I will not bless you beyond your imagination, when we when we give our tithes and, and offerings to you and uh, without holding it back, oh God. Let us experience that, which you will ex which you will do it in our life because it is your promise to us. Thank you, Jesus. Continue to speak to us through, through the word today, O oh God. Thank you, God. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And as we continue to worship our God through the giving of our tithes and offering, the offering baskets are at the back. And let's do this with joyful heart and let's clap and celebrate this moment of worship uh, in the service. So let's do that. Praise God. Well, today we are going to do something different, of course. So we are going to look at uh, from the Word of God as we continue.
this whole idea of God uses unexpected and broken people and also the unexpected situation. Logan is going to help me in, in this. Um, I believe and I trust that uh, we have some uh, you know, amazing young people who are called to do different things, but you, know, uh, you, can, do, you can do many different things and still serve God and still uh, you know, preach the gospel. And he's going to help me today. So Logan, are you comfortable coming up here, sitting with me uh, on the stage here? Just come on up. And then when it is his turn, so I'm going to take and, um, and do the first part, and Logan is going to do the second part, and, and God is going to speak, uh, have, have a seat, yeah, speak uh, through, through the word of God. So we are focusing on 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, chapter 16, 1 to 13, and let me read this, uh, some of it at least, uh, so that we can uh, get, a, get a glimpse of that. And it is about uh, Samuel uh, trying to find David to anoint him as a king. And this is what it says. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. And Saul was a king. And if we know about Saul's life, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And I have rejected him as a king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Uh, find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord uh, instructed when he arrived at Bethlehem. The, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong? They, they asked, do you come in peace? And Samuel said, yes. Replied, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, purify yourselves and come, come with me to the sacrifice. Then, then Samuel performed the purification rite to, for Jesse and his sons and invited them to sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel uh, took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by the appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearances, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then, you know, Samuel goes through, you know, J.C. presents many, you know, different sons one by one. And so, you know, let's go down to the scripture there. There is still, and, and none of them Lord has selected. Then there is still the youngest, Jesse, replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Sent for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes and the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. And we are talking about David. And we are going to really focus on David today. So this is what we are going to do today that uh, I'm going to really reflect on David's life and who David was. Um, and... We're going to look at a couple of situations really quickly. We are allocated about 12 minutes each, so I need to kind of finish that in 12 minutes and then give as much time to Logan to kind of, uh, kind of um, for him to, to reflect on the Word of God. And as we are talking about the unexpected people, the broken people, unexpected situations, 
there are a couple of situations I want to focus on as, you know, as David's, through the David's life. And the first verse in Samuel chapter 16, this is what it says. And the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Since I have rejected him as a king, now fill your uh, horn with the olive oils and, and go look for the king because I have chosen the king. And the situation is such that he is, Samuel is afraid. He's saying, if I do that while Saul is still a king, he's going to be upset and he's going to probably hunt me and kill me. And that's not going to be a good news for me because I do not want that. And on the other hand, David is minding his own business. He is, you know, looking after the sheep and, uh, and the goats, and that's what he's doing. The last thing he has on his mind is God is going to make him a king. As we know about David, David is, you know, when we talk about David, we always say, and Bible says, that David is a man after God's own heart. So he was a true worshiper of God. He was, he will obey God and, and you know, uh, he would worship God and through music and whatever he did, but his job was extremely simple. And not in the eyes of the world, people were not looking to kind of just go and, and look after the sheep and goats and take care of them. And that is what he was doing. And as he was doing, it was, you know, it was very interesting that um, God really chose David. And he, he was a simple man. He was just doing the simple work. And God uses these situations in our life to sometimes to just, just use the, you know, surprising situations that to, to give us the, a big job in our lives when we least expect it. And, and God did that for, for David, and he says to, uh, he, he calls, you know, for David, Samuel calls for David, and he anoints him. Just imagine, David just kind of came, and he did not know what was going on. And here... You know, Samuel the prophet is present in their home. And next thing he knew that God is anointing him or Samuel is anointing him as a king. Many times God uses very surprising, gives us very surprising solutions in our lives. And sometimes we are looking for the solutions which are, you know, which are which are kind of a standard solutions with the logic and with, uh, with really, oh, this, for, for this problem, this, this kind of a solution, it fits. But God always brings surprising and unexpected solution for the problem. You know, David did not fit the bill to be a king. And yet, God selected him to be his king. And he used him for his glory uh, in, a, in a many different way. You know, we are not going to go in that, that situation. But the second thing I want to kind of, you know, focus on David, just to understand who David was. I want to look into 1 Samuel chapter 17 a little bit. And the story there is a very familiar story, which you have probably learned in your Sunday school, if you went to Sunday school as the kids. And uh, the story is about Goliath. And David is visiting his, his brothers on the battlefield kind of a thing. And it describes in chapter 17 and verse 4, then a champion came out 
from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, I'm going to describe to you Goliath from the word of God. There's a lot of good description given about Goliath. The reason we need to kind of know about Goliath you think what, you know, just create a picture about Goliath in your mind, in your heart. And David was exactly opposite of Goliath. And so his height was, what, six cubits and a span. And if you make the calculation, he was nine feet, nine inches. Can you imagine that? Nine feet, nine inches. Huge man, you know. And he was almost 10 feet. I mean, it's Ronnie, you'll be just a tiny guy in front of him, you know. Even Ben would be. <laughs> and, uh, and even tallest people, you know, I don't know who is the tallest man in the world, uh, but I haven't heard 10 feet, you know, that height. And then verses 5 and 7, it says, he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scales, armor, and bronze, you know, and he was heavily armed, and, and um, on the legs he wore bronze, uh, you know, the, the covering, and, the, uh, and then he was ready to fight. And um, he had all the equipments that were needed, and he was wearing about 175 to 200 pounds worth of protection gear, on top of him. And he was standing there mocking God's people. You know, verses 8 and 9. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel. Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will come, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. So this is a direct challenge, and it's a very familiar story. And then he's mocking, and he's just kind of, you know, uh, letting people know that, you know, I am the man, and, uh, you know, there is, there is probably no challenge, and the Saul is just kind, kind of hiding inside, and, and he's just kind of telling, uh, you know, does not have a solution for that as a king of Israel. And David comes. He comes not prepared to fight. He comes just to kind of give food to his brothers there on the battlefield, and he sees Goliath. So imagine, there is not a great description given there, but imagine this Goliath and this David is here, and he is kind of really not happy about what Goliath is doing. So this tall man, and with all the equipments, and, and David is just standing in front of him, and he says, I will take the challenge. You know the story. I will take the challenge. Without any protective gears and, you know, small equipment with the stone to, to throw at Goliath. He stands and faces the challenge. And then you know Goliath is looking at him and mocking him. I, I just want to, I know this is a very familiar story, but I want you to create this picture in your mind today. And he is standing, and, and of course, you know the story, you know, David kills Goliath, as, a, as the story goes, as the Bible tells us. And David is just ordinary person, very tiny person in front of Goliath, not prepared at all. Nothing that he knows that, you know, that with the world standard or with the war standard then, he was not the guy you would put in front of Goliath. Of course not. 
And yet, he trusts the Lord and he says, I will do this. And God calls him to do this in his heart and in his soul. And he stands and he kills Goliath. That is, that is what it happens. But I want to picture a contrast between Goliath and David. Goliath was just fitted the bill for the war and winning the war and doing the job. And if you would put them side by side, which they were right in front, nobody would have, you know, bet on David. Oh, man, this is an underdog, of course. And I don't know, I don't watch football at all, but I don't know which are the underdog teams or, you know, in any sports. Yankees or, you know. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, but you want to kind of cheer for underdog, but you don't want to bet on them. You know, it's like, man, I'm going to lose money on this. And that was the case for David. That is who he was. Not prepared in a sense, not equipped enough, physically also not standing up to Goliath. And yet God chooses him, unexpected person, in unexpected situations. And I want to also, I want you to also think about unexpected situations. When he was anointed, it was an unexpected situation for him. God just brings unexpected situations in our lives. When he was fighting this with Goliath, it was not planned at all. It just happened, unexpected thing. And it was not an easy job. It was a big, complicated job that David had to do. And not only unexpected situation, but unexpected person who is weak, in a sense, as compared to Goliath. I'm not saying that David was weak by itself, but as compared to Goliath, weak, unprepared, and just not ready for that kind of a fight, and he stands. Here is the thing. God uses, of course, unexpected situations, surprising situations in our lives. We may never think that this situation God will use in our life to, in a positive way. But he brings about unexpected situations and uses those situations for us in a positive way. He uses unexpected people like Goliath and gives them the huge responsibility. And we may feel many times that God may use, give us a big, big responsibility. And you just kind of stand before that staring, God, are you sure you want me to do this? This looks like Goliath. I'm not prepared for it. I do not have skills for it. I'm, I have, I'm, I'm just not cut out for these kinds of things. And are you sure you're asking me to do this? this you, must, you must have dialed the wrong number. But over and over in the word of God, we see God uses people who are unexpected to be chosen, broken people, and simple people. So if you, if you put yourself in that category, and God is giving you the huge responsibility you think you're not prepared, God has called the right number. God has called the right number. Here is the reality. When God gives you an assignment, you're never prepared for it. You're never, ever prepared for that assignments. And God still puts you in that situation and uses amazingly if you will respond and let God do the things that he wants to do through your life. That is what David's life was, and that is what we should put ourselves in David's, David's uh, uh, f you know, shoes and really think through that and say, God, are you calling me? It's an unexpected situation. But Logan is going to come and take time. You know, I don't want to pressure you, Logan. Just feel free to take as much as time as you want, okay? 
and uh, speak to us why God, spoke, why God chose David in this whole scenario. So we, we kind of looked at it, who David was and how God chose him. Come, come uh, Logan, and, and just minister to us here. Um, really quick, Heather did tell me a little bit ago that she's done with the kids. I, I don't see any up here still, but just so you know, if there are any more kids. Um, also, if I go a little bit late, I get to blame Pastor because he went over 12 minutes. So, <laughs> But um, as Pastor said, David wasn't strong in, in, in stature. He definitely was no match for Goliath. And he was very unremarkable as a uh, human being, at least in his strength. So God obviously didn't choose him for, for that reason. Um, but I wanted to talk about why God did choose David then. Like, why would God choose David? Um, and there are three specific uh, reasons I want to go over. One of them is very explicitly listed in the passage. One of them is implied, and then one is kind of inferred from the rest of Scripture. If we look earlier in 1 Samuel, um, uh, first of all, the first reason is that Saul didn't obey God's commandments. In fact, the Bible actually says, and I'll get to that verse, that if Saul did obey his commandments, then there wouldn't be a reason for God to choose David because God would have kept Saul king. Looking back in, uh, earlier in 1 Samuel, starting in 10.8, uh, God is telling Saul through the prophet Samuel to go down to Gilgal and to wait for him and to wait for Saul for seven days and then when Samuel comes he'll offer a sacrifice and then he'll tell Saul what to do because at this point they're warring with the Philistines. We see later in 1 Samuel 13, 8 through 9, it says he waited seven days until the appointed time that Samuel had set but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattering from him, that is the people in, in his army. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Later on, Samuel comes up and says, what have you done? <laughs> like, why did you do this? And this is where we see uh, the first instance, I think the first instance of God's rejection of Saul as king. Samuel says to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For the Lord now would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So that's where we see the first reason that God chose David because he had rejected Saul because Saul had rejected God effectively by ignoring his commandments. And this isn't the only time Saul um, ignores God's commandments or doesn't follow it. Um, word for word. There's a second time in 1 Samuel 15, 3, and actually throughout a lot of 1 Samuel 15, Samuel says to Saul, now go and strike Amalek and completely destroy everything that he has and do not spare him. Put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And for a little bit of background, uh, the Amalekites were a people who had attacked Israel as they were coming up out of Egypt. And God had told them, um, and you can read that in Deuteronomy 15, or sorry, Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19, God tells the Israelite people, when you come into the land I promised you, you need to utterly destroy the Amalekites because they did not fear God and they attacked you on your way out of Egypt and so provoked God. And so here, God is telling Saul to destroy the Amalekites. Verses 7 to 11, it says, Then Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah going towards Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured King Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and completely destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the more valuable animals, the lambs, and everything that was good, and were unwilling to destroy them completely. But everything despicable and weak, 
or sorry, uh, but everything despicable and weak, they completely destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was furious and cried out to the Lord all night. So there's a second instance where God commands Saul, destroy the Amalekites completely, don't spare any of them, but he spares the king and he spares the best of the animals. And later on through the rest of chapter 15, I won't read that, um, you see more instances of this disobedience and pride. Uh, Saul builds a monument to himself. He tries to argue with Samuel, saying, oh no, I, I kept the best of the animals to sacrifice to God. I wanted to keep them to sacrifice to God. And then Samuel keeps <laughs> berating him, effectively. And then Saul says, okay, I'm, I shouldn't have done that. It, it was the people's fault. I listened to them. That was, that was my fault. But putting blame on the people. And even afterwards, when Samuel says multiple times, God has rejected you from being king. God has rejected you from being king. He says it twice. Saul is still asking Samuel, well, well, come with me so that I'm honored in the eyes of the people. So even though he knows God has rejected him at that point, he's still seeking honor for himself. And so this is a continual thing where Saul is being disobedient and has turned from God. So that's the first reason that God chose David. But then, why did God choose David specifically? Okay, so he had rejected Saul and he needed someone in his place, but why did he choose David? We can pretty safely infer that it was because God, or sorry, David was a man after God's own heart, as, as Pastor read that passage. Um, as Samuel is speaking to Saul, he's saying, your kingdom shall not endure. God has chosen a man after his own heart, which is David. And then we also see in chapter 16, as Pastor also read, God does not see as man sees, since man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So it's very clear that David had a heart for God. He was a man after God's own heart. And that is part of why God chose him. This isn't the only passage in Scripture. It's a pretty well-known passage in Scripture, this one right here. But it's not the only place where God talks about how he seeks um, to understand the hearts of men and how he looks at them and he understands them. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, um, the prophet Hanani is speaking to King Asa. And he says, The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth, so that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. And also in Zechariah uh, 4.10, Zech the prophet Zechariah is um, speaking with God and he's having a vision. And part of, in part of the vision, God says, these are the eyes of the Lord which roam to and fro throughout the earth. It's even in the New Testament, if you look in Revelation 2.23, Jesus is talking to John about one of the churches earlier on. And he's talking and then he says, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Back in uh, 1 Chronicles 28.9, um, David is talking to Solomon, because David is old, and he's telling Solomon instructions for the temple and how to be king. Um, this isn't his final exhortation, but it's kind of near that point. And so he says, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father, and serve him wholeheartedly and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever, which is what happened to Saul. So God chose David because Saul was disobedient, and so he rejected Saul. And David's heart was after God. And we can see in the rest of Scripture that God so strongly supports those whose heart is completely his. And that is how David is described. But another reason... Um, which is seen in other examples throughout scripture, is perhaps because David was weak, because David was not king material, because he was just a mere shepherd boy. Because when God uses weak people to do something great, there's no other explanation for that than God, and so all the glory goes to God. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is in Judges 7, when you have the story of Gideon um, defeating the Midianites with he and his 300 men. Because in, Judge, in Judges 7, 2, it says, The Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to hand Midian over to them. Otherwise, Israel become, would become boastful, saying, My own power has saved me. And the amount of men he had at the time was 32,000, and God ended up narrowing it down to 300 men, so that Israel couldn't say, Look at how great we are. Look at how we defeated the Midianites. Look at the power we have. So they had no other choice but to give glory to God. 
You could argue the same thing for the Israelites leaving Egypt. There's no other explanation for that than the power of God because there's no way they could have done that otherwise. Um, and also in the New Testament, uh, when Paul is talking about uh, the thorn in his flesh that he kept pleading to God to, to remove from him, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says, Paul says, and he, God, has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in distresses, in persecutions, in difficulties, in behalf of Christ, for when I am weak, then I am strong. The point being, when God uses weak people, it is because it brings more glory to him because it just shows that only God can do that. And of course, only God can do anything, even if people are capable. Say, Saul was um, a very tall guy. He was the tallest. He was a head taller than anybody else in all Israel. And he looked like a king. Even David looked, says he looked handsome. But everything about them, God had already given to them. So, but through some of these situations, God emphasizes even more his power and his sovereignty. I don't have time to read it, but um, in 1 Corinthians 1, it talks about how the word of the cross is foolishness to those who hear it. Um, specifically talking about the Jews at that time who would stumble over that idea that Christ would die for them. Talking about how the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. How God is sovereign. He will use the weak and the foolish things of the world, the, people, the things that the world sees as weak and foolish, for his glory. And it's well-pleasing that he does that because it gives glory to him. Another reason that God chose David is ultimately that he is sovereign. We can say that David, because um, you could go down a dangerous slope arguing that David deserved to be king because he was after God's own heart. And though he wasn't you know, physically strong or big or of a royal family, we don't want to go down the wrong path saying that Daniel deserved to be king because nobody does. But ultimately, although God did use him because he was after his own heart, ultimately it is up to God. And sometimes good things happen to wicked people and sometimes bad things happen to good people. I think the story of Job is a pretty um, good example of that. Um, in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 9, specifically verses 6 through 29, I won't read all of it. But he talks about, Paul is talking to people about God's choice for Israel and how he chose Isaac over, or sorry, how he chose Jacob over Esau and how he made Jacob into Israel and Esau became the Edomites, the people that he rejected, the people that fought against Israel and that is ultimately a sovereign decision. But again, as Paul says, he quotes uh, Moses in Exodus, or sorry, he quotes Exodus, um, when God is speaking to Moses, and he says, I will have mercy on whomever I have mercy, and I will show compassion to whomever I show compassion. So then, it does not depend on the person who wants it, nor the one who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very reason I raised you up, in order to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed throughout the earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? On the contrary, who are you, you foolish person, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does the potter not have the right over the clay? Or to make from the same lump one object for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known, endured with great patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction, and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon objects of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, namely us whom he also called, not only from among Jews, but also from among Gentiles. Uh, 
the whole chapter is good. I, was encourage you to, I would encourage you to read it. But then again, we see an example of God's sovereignty. If you look earlier as he's talking about Jacob and Esau, Paul says, what shall we say then? There's no injustice with God, is there? Far from it. Then again, quoting um, God in Exodus, saying, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and compassion on whom I have compassion. Sometimes choices may seem arbitrary, say, like why Job had to suffer rather than somebody else, or why David was made king rather than somebody else, or even why Saul was made king, because apparently he did not have that same heart after God, but God still chose him. Or even Pharaoh, as Paul talks about in Romans, Pharaoh was chosen, even though he did not obey God, he didn't fear God. In fact, he kept rejecting and hardening his heart against God. But God still used him for his glory. I suppose the question is whether we want to be on God's side when he uses us for his glory. So if, if God is sovereign then, and he can just choose whoever he wills, and he will choose whoever he wills, then what are, what are we supposed to do? Sometimes God chooses people who are after his own heart, and sometimes he chooses people who are specifically against him. So what's the lesson for us? What, what difference does it make? Near the end of Ecclesiastes, which uh, Solomon wrote in his later years, it says in chapter 12, verse 13, the conclusion when everything has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. And the reason is given in the next verse. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. God knows our hearts. Uh, I read those verses earlier talking about how he searches the hearts of men to see whose heart is completely his, and he strongly supports them. God knows what your intentions are. God knows what your heart is. God knows whether you're seeking him or not, um, no matter what it looks like on the outside. And so... That is what we are meant to pursue. And God will use us however he wants. And if he uses us for something great to be a king like David, then that's great. And if he wants us to be humble and quiet and just of our own lives, I, I like um, the story of um, Caleb, the spy, when the Israelites are going out to scout the promised land. But Caleb and Joshua um, didn't fear, and they were ready to go in. And in the end, Caleb ends up getting his own land. Nothing great happens to him, but he gets God's blessing. And we can always have that peace when we're following God and pursuing his commandments and we're listening to him. We can have that peace knowing that God is on our side. Whether or not he makes us into something great or something small, he will use us for his glory. And that is really what gives us peace. There are a few other verses I want to read about that. Um, one of them is actually just hanging up on the door out there in Psalm 84.10. For one day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. And I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. In Proverbs 16.20, it says, One who pays attention to the word will find good, and blessed is one who trusts in the Lord. God promises blessing in many ways throughout Scripture for those who will keep them. That doesn't mean life will always go well. In fact, it often means life won't go well. But if we know God is with us, we still have that peace that transcends understanding when we pray and we make a request known to God with thanksgiving, but also submitting to his will, knowing that whatever happens, we are in his hands and that is peace enough for us, because we know we have promise for what happens after this life. Um, there is uh, Philippians 4, 12 through 13. Paul says, I know how to get along with little, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and, have, and suffering need. I can do all things who Christ who strengthens me. And then lastly, I just want to end with a couple psalms. Um, I encourage you to read all of them. I I'm not going to read all of them. Um, but I'll read some excerpts from Psalm 91 and from Psalm 145. And also encourage you to read Psalm 34 if you can. But Psalm 145, 18 through 20 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call on him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord is near to all who love him but all the wicked he will destroy. And in Psalm 91, it says, Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. 
With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. So whatever you do, whatever um, God places you in, whether that's in a high position of leadership with much responsibility or serving others and, uh, where you don't get much, seen much for it, whatever God gives you, wherever God puts your way, whatever position God puts you in, serve him and, he will, and you will have that knowing that you are doing God's will and that you're in his hands. No, don't don't do that. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. okay. That's great. We're just going to pray close this uh, service today. Uh, it is amazing to hear uh, hear from Logan, and uh, I know we are all. I'm blessed. Thank you, Logan. For, for doing this and uh, we'll do, during this summer we'll be using some of our young people to kind of do these types of things uh, we want to um, just affirm what God has called them to do uh, and so um, you know uh, this is a good thing so uh, just just bow our heads today give thanks to God and, um, and then we'll we'll go uh, father in heaven thank you God for your grace God for your word. Thank you, God, for using Logan uh, to uh, give us uh, the word of God, O oh Father God, and uh, bless us, O oh Father, that uh, how the scripture tells us and that uh, we can be used for his glory. It doesn't matter what God gives us and where he it is important to be in your will, O oh Father God. Just um, Help us, O oh God, to walk the path that you have carved for us. Make it clear in our life, doesn't matter what stage of life we are in, that we are always here on the face of the earth to be used. It is not just about us, O oh Father God, but to respond to your call and be obedient to that, O oh Father. So have, our, have, have your way, O oh Father, in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for each and every person who is here, who is watching online, who will be watching online also. Speak to our hearts in a powerful way, O oh Father, and have your way. As we go from here today, that you will give us the peace and you will uh, go ahead of us, create a path for us, Put your hand of protection upon us and also, Father, lead our way in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, you can hang around for, for the song uh, or, uh, and then we'll just close the service then. want to stand we'll sing praise is rising
tonight. You are dismissed. Have a blessed week.